This episode was made possible by a Patreon donation by TNM Comics, creating fantastic realms of demon hunters, warring gods, and more. And by The Roommate from Hell, a webcomic about gays and their metaphorical and literal demons. Thank you. Like pretty much any storytelling medium, music theater has had to cope with the fact that parts of its canon don't always reflect the most progressive values. I mean, Annie Oakley throwing away her shot for the sake of male ego has been considered a bad ending for at least two decades, and sooner or later we are going to have to deal with one of the most revered musicals of all time having a racial slur for a title. But the burr in a lot of blankets lately seems to be Oklahoma, which on one hand is an influential piece which helped codify much of the classic musical structure, but on the other hand... Well, it is basically a story about a fight between the jerk on Twitter who tells people to kill themselves and the moderator of an incel community on Reddit and the girl who gets permanently traumatized as a result. And that doesn't even get into the subplot. You just know Ado Annie's dad would be one of those bozos who poses in his daughter's prom photos with a rifle. But how much of the musical's issues are the result of the music theater structure and how much are endemic to the work itself? To answer that question, we'll be taking a look at the play Green Grow the Lilacs by Lynn Riggs. Raleigh Lynn Riggs was born outside of Claremore, Oklahoma in 1899, and although he spent much of his adult life in Santa Fe, New York, and Los Angeles, his work is most strongly influenced by the home of his childhood. Pioneer life, folk humor, and violent passions are frequent in his plays, as are stock characters like the kindly aunt, likely based on his own beloved Aunt Mary, and the itinerant peddler. Green Grow the Lilacs is by far his most famous work, but it's difficult to say how well known it would be today if it weren't for the influence of Rodgers and Hammerstein. Its 1931 premiere on Broadway lasted a mere 64 performances, and while it was restaged several times during the 30s and 40s, it only occasionally turns up today. If nothing else, Riggs is heralded as one of his native state's greatest writers, having been inducted into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame and honored with a park and museum in his home of Claremore. So here's how it originally went down. It's a beautiful morning in Indian Territory in 1900 when cowboy Curly McLean pays a call to the homestead of Aunt Eller Murphy. Curly flirts amiably with Aunt Eller, but it becomes obvious that he'd much rather be flirting with her niece, Lori, who he wants to ask to a play party that evening. Unfortunately for him, Lori's doing this I like you but I don't want to admit it so I'll be mean to you thing, and anyway she's already agreed to go with her hired hand, Jeter, instead. Not because she likes him, but because she's convinced that if she rejected him, he'd do something terrible. Aunt Eller tries to soothe away her fears, but given that a conversation between Curly and Jeter reveals the latter has a disturbing interest in stories of women being tortured and murdered, Lori's probably on to something. Although Lori is able to stave off Jeter's attentions by getting her friend Ado Annie to ride to the party with them, he eventually gets her alone and she's forced to fend off an assault, resulting in Lori firing Jeter and Jeter swearing revenge. Curly proposes to Lori shortly thereafter and the two are married, but sure enough Jeter turns up during a rough ritual hazing, tries to burn the couple alive, and falls on his knife during a struggle with Curly. Curly is taken into custody, leaving Lori forlorn, but on the day before his trial, he sneaks out of prison to be with her, so even if they don't get him for manslaughter, he'll probably serve time for escaping custody, but Aunt Eller convinces the posse sent to retrieve Curly that a little conjugal visit won't hurt nobody, and Curly goes upstairs to spend one night with his wife before facing an uncertain future. When you read Green Grow the Lilacs, it's easy to see why Rodgers and Hammerstein saw it as promising material for a musical, because it's practically a musical already. Folk songs play a significant role in the plot, serving as outlets for characters' feelings or adding color to the onstage action. The songs in question are often filled with loneliness, heartbreak, and tragedy, and add richness and scope to the mostly ordinary lives of the characters. Even the dialogue has a certain poetry and lyricism to it. Riggs is very fond of the rhythm of language and the interplay of conversation between people and lets things proceed at a leisurely pace so he can indulge in the words of the characters. 
All in all, it's easy to see why he suggests an old song as an alternate title for the play. With the young lovers parted by bitter rivalry ending badly, it does feel like a folk ballad in prose. But for all its natural musicality, Rodgers and Hammerstein were operating in the traditional musical comedy structure, and that's where most of the complications come in. For example, Riggs' play doesn't really have a subplot. Edo Annie is a minor character, the Middle Eastern peddler appears in a couple scenes and is never named, and Will Parker is only mentioned in passing. The musical needed to expand all these characters and their relationships to create the comic beta couple featured in most musical comedies. Then, too, there's the whole comedy aspect of the whole thing. While Oklahoma does go into some pretty dark territory compared to many of the shows that came before it, it's still significantly lighter in tone than Green Grow the Lilacs, which can feel downright grim at times. Even the shivery scene comes off as less playful and more unsettling than it does in the musical. Lori seems to be traumatized as much by that as she is by seeing someone die in front of her. And, of course, Riggs' ending is much more open-ended and bittersweet than the musicals, which mostly wants to clear Curly of any wrongdoing so it can move on to the happy ending. I wonder what would have happened if Rodgers and Hammerstein adapted this in a time when music theater audiences were accustomed to darker and more ambiguous material. It might have held more of the somber tone of Riggs' play. Or at least someone might have pointed out that an offhand comment about being able to hang oneself with a rope is awkward enough without going into a whole song about it. Get all that Wyoming will be your new home.